We're here with another segment of Salt and Roses, of course, with Neil Helmer, uh, our local historian, the gentleman who's in charge of this segment. And uh, we're also joined by Kim Elliott, who, of course, some people might know him. He's an ex-firefighter. He's a history buff uh, of Windsor. He's a deacon of Sandwich First Baptist Church in, you know, over there in uh, the West End. And a descendant of the Underground Railroad. Uh, I appreciate you being here, Kim. We're going to talk today because we're on the tail end of Black History Month. We're going to try and try and conjure up a bit of information about downtown and Windsor and its black history. So, what do we ha- what kind of what are we talking about here? It's pretty significant, you know. We we touch on black history, but it's it's inexorable. You can't you can't separate Windsor's history from Windsor's black history. Let's talk about the roots of the African African uh, Canadian community here in Windsor. Where, did, where does this come from? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, most people would think it comes entirely from the Underground Railroad. Yeah. And indeed, that's where most of the populace, uh, the period of Underground Railroad, say the 1830s or 40s, yeah. um, where the majority of the populace came from. Um, but as long as there's been uh, settlement other than non-native mm-hmm. in this area, there's been African Canadians. And I'll qualify that by saying um, we were in every endeavor, even outside of slavery. Um, for instance, Matthew de Costa, last year we celebrated the 400th year. He was an interpreter, interpreter with Samuel D. Champlain. Wow. So it's not inconceivable. So we're that talking 1600s. Yeah, <laughs> 1600s. Yeah. It's not inconceivable that he came down this Absolutely. way uh, he's an interpreter of Mi'kmaq language. Yep. Wow. And how did that happen? What did he know about Mi'kmaq language? <laughs> so we're going to keep it to modern history, but uh, there has been intercontinental travel from Africa to Canada, along from Spain and the Portuguese to, to the North Americas. To, to the French so, being here and the British. Yeah, so they came the along with the, the explorers and what have you. Um, but when you talk about population, I think we're talking about critical mass. Yeah. Right? When did they start to what settle they, here yeah. on mass? Um, that was during, um, I would say, from the 1820s yeah, right to the 1860s, the Civil War, yeah, even past the Civil War. Yeah. Yeah, past the Civil War. Uh, they came here as refugees, mm-hmm. so let's say that. Uh, there, were, there were peoples of African descent enslaved here mm-hmm. with the French and the, British, and the British while there was slavery going on in the United yeah. States, of course. Um, so, 1700s, 1800s. Yeah. It's, not, it's not until the 1790s where slavery is actually, no new slaves are allowed to be yeah. 1793 to be exact. Yeah. The Governor Simcoe. Yeah. Governor Simcoe. Led or at least uh, signed yeah. some of the, uh, the first legislation. It was the first step for getting... That prevented the introduction of new, new slaves. slaves. But in there those were still slaves. There was definitely slaves yeah. Wow. At 25 years of age, you could be set free. Yeah. And your children were not considered slaves. Yeah. So that was going on. However, the influx came. Say during that period, there might have been 2,000 slaves of African descent in Upper and Lower Canada, maybe three, 4,000. With the advent of the Underground Railroad, right, which was its trade name for the slaves being cargo, yep. they moved along by conductors or the Quakers, First Nations people. Yeah. Helpers. From so safe house, helpers from yep. safe house yeah. to safe house or station to station. Abolitionism. Then it grew to about 40, 50,000 people. Yeah. And Jeez. It, and you, we talk about in Windsor, say they were a quarter of the population, 1,000 out of 4,000. And in Chatham. This is about 1860, we're talking yeah. about one quarter of the population. So right. We one quarter of the population of Windsor, of Windsor in 1860 exactly. yes. was African Canadian. Yes. And this is very slaves. significant. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it is a part of Windsor history. But also Canadian history. You got to understand this yeah. was the most this populated a, area of Canada point, right? at the People time. Elsewhere. What's that, Neil? This is a staging point, right? So this is these 40, 50,000 people, are, a lot of them are coming through this area. Well, not only is it the staging point, this is right. the edge of the frontier, yeah. the Canadian frontier, yeah. right? When you start going west, there's hardly no one out there. Yeah. There may be people on the west coast, mm-hmm. right, to protect it from invasion. Sure. But there's really nothing between southwestern Ontario, posts in various areas like Winnipeg, maybe, and then the, the coast. So um, this was not only a quarter of the population of Windsor, a quarter of the population of Canada, yeah. when it burns into 50, 40, 50,000 slaves, there's probably only 200,000 people in Canada wow. at that time. 
Well, how many now? What were those? What were those individuals doing in Windsor if they there's, were here? There's a great question. A so I talk, start. start out by saying that some of them came along with explorers, but they were merchants. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them were merchants. Some of them were soldiers. Yep. They fought on both sides of the Civil War in the United States, and they fought on both sides of the War of 1812. Yep. Both as British loyalists. Yep. Right. And as um, what did they what did they deem the Americans at that time? Uh, Patriots, right? So they, they fought on both sides of that war. So they were here as soldiers. Mm -hmm. They were um, they worked on steamships, tradesmen. They were tradesmen. That's right. They were uh, editors, as we know. Yeah. Henry Bibb. So well, Mary and Shad. Mary and Shad. Too, yeah. So, and they. Mary and Shad. You said yeah. Shad. Yeah. S H A D D. Two D's uh, or yes, one D. Two D's. Shad. Yeah. So I think it's important when we talk about Underground Railroad to realize they were both cargo or slaves and conductors. Yeah. And what makes that significant, or how that came about, is even during the times of slavery in the United States, the Mason-Dixon line that ran across Kentucky, mm -hmm. everything below that was considered the slave states. Yes. Everything above that was considered the free states. Yeah. Right? So that's what we have to really recognize, so that there were a lot of free blacks in the northern United States mm -hmm. and throughout Canada at the time when slavery was roaring. So take, for instance, our church, Samus First Baptist Church, on the west side, granted, and at least two of the churches downtown Windsor, Tanner AME. Tanner AME, yeah. Tanner AME on McDougal in Tuscarora, First Baptist Church Windsor on Mercer in Tuscarora, and the BME Church over on Lewis Avenue, which at one time used to be rated City Hall Square. They also were built during that 1830s, 40s, 50s wow. era. Yeah. by free blacks and masons so that when the slaves came they were accommodated by free blacks yeah and they merged with free blacks so that's why uh, not only were they building these structures these churches served as safe houses and they served as schools and you name it there were blacks like Henry Bibb and uh, Marianne Chapp actually writing anti-slavery articles yeah. during this time Wow and that was happening in Detroit as well so let's 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 change gears. I want I want to know about the significance of uh, particularly of McDougal Street, of Windsor Market, and uh, and Windsor's Black History. Okay. Well, McDougal Street would have been would have been seen as the old that avenue of the Black com it was community. The hub. Yeah. It, it wow. was the main thoroughfare, and it, it was coincident that it was one of Windsor's main streets as well, mm. as there was a ferry landing down the bottom of there. Mm. That, that ferry landing bought goods. From the United States and throughout you know, Upper Canada, but also brought slaves. So they doffed just like slaves, right? Yeah. And it was a main uh, artery for trade. So the Afro Canadian free blacks, as well as the Centers of the Underground Railroad, stayed in that area for their basic needs. That's where the food was, that's yes. where clothing was, that's where shelter was, and that's where jobs were. They were still labor, right? Yes. As well as merchants. Some of them owned shops. Uh, the Frontier Club, they own motels, they own taverns, you name it. Um, but they also needed jobs. So this became known as South Detroit. And it's also known as uh, Black Bottom was over Tin Can City, yeah. off Totten, right? Yeah. Old Savage Town, those were kind of the areas. The majority of them stayed here up until the 1850s. In 51 and 52, the United States uh, proclamated something known as the Fugitive Slave Law whereby slave owners could come up into the free states and over into Canada and take their slaves back. They could claim them. Now, our government might not have been so keen on that. They were us. They had the legal authority by, by their government. Right. Well, our yeah. government vehemently opposed it. Absolutely. And we were willing to defend some of the slaves here physically, if necessary, uh, militarily. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's a good place to leave off, and we'll come back, and I want to talk a bit more about... Uh, how exactly that has uh, translated over to today. Is there still a population of uh, African Canadians on McDougal, which I think there is. So we'll be right back with a follow-up video.